Jump right into it. Uh, this project is under the FDX program um, cloud service certification. So all that is is uh, an idea concept that came up with uh, as I was consulting with many banks around the world and seeing the same problem, which is everybody is having a novel approach to certifying or building secure configurations to be able to use a cloud service, whether it be Amazon, Google, Azure, Red Hat, whoever. So given that, banks are moving very, very slowly. Not just banks, but really any company that I've worked with is moving very, very slowly into the cloud. So kind of built up a process, a series of artifacts, documents, code, behavior-driven development, uh, things that will create high levels of assurance with your compliance teams, your security teams, because it's all provable and repeatable, rather than just documentation that's outdated the time you create it. So with that, this project, because essentially JP Morgan, uh, the company I, I work for right now, is not trying to differentiate um, or finding this is a competitive differentiator between us and other banks. Being able to use cloud services themselves is not something that we find to be a competitive advantage. Also, the amount of effort it takes just to build these one by one by one is a really inefficient use of time considering we're all trying to do this at the same time. Hence, open source it, work with the other banks, collaborate together, get a lot more done, spend less money. And turns out Finos and other banks thought this was a good idea, so here we are. So I'm gonna dive right into it. I like to do Q and A's, uh, so I'll stop and ask questions or allow for questions, so just be ready for that. I think the slide decks are available, but I mean, feel free to take pictures and things like that. So the repos have changed over time because I think uh, Finos you know, normalized everything. Um, the second one under there is actually our first contribution from some of the vendors that are contributing to the project, which is great. Um, because obviously vendors want to take on what the banks are saying, this is what we need to be compliant to use cloud services. Some of the vendors that are participating are actually building products on top of this immediately for sale. Um, Google Groups and Wiki, this is standard throughout all the FinOS projects, so if you're familiar, this is nothing new. If this is the first time you're exposed to it, this is kind of how we communicate. All right, um, cloud services at a bank. Uh, if you're working at a bank, you know that Sometimes this can be a daunting task. It's very difficult to get approved or uh, it's just a flat out no. So this project is how do we go about building the configurations, proving that it is compliant to existing control frameworks and then making it repeatable and sharing it out uh, in an open source way. The culture of no, I think everybody that has been doing this knows about this already because when they are asked to uh, present their idea to an architecture review board or central cyber or something like that, they usually get a no. And that's not usually followed by a why. It's just no. And when you dig into that, a lot of times people find that it's not because they really don't want to do it, it's just because they don't yet know how to do it. So again, competitive differentiator. I'm moving around because the light's are really bright. So. Now since I can see you, I can see if you're sleeping. <laughs> so the point of this is we want to use cloud. We all want to use cloud. We have to be able to do it in a regulatory compliant way. And again, working together, we can do this in a more effective and uh, a larger impact way. So the ch changing the culture of no to a culture of yes, the story of how we did this at JP Morgan, I'm going to go into a little bit about that, and then I'll dive into the technical details of each artifact and we could have a little bit of Q&A. But essentially, about two years ago, started on this idea of, hey, wouldn't it be great if all this stuff that cyber is telling us to do, we could just codify it? And that way, because we're software developers, we know what the hell we're talking about. Because whatever they're saying doesn't make any sense to me, and whatever I'm saying doesn't make any sense to them. So that was the premise. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. So we started building that. And as we started building it, we go, okay, we're meeting with our compliance teams. We're 
large control frameworks, all this fun stuff. What does that mean when we're talking about cloud? What does that mean when it looks like code? So instead of a high level statement that says, data must be encrypted to enforce data security standards. Okay, so in the past that was roll your own encryption. Well, I think a lot of people have learned that's a bad idea. Great, okay, so now I just turn on encryption. Okay, but where does that really work? Does it work? This is why this sort of stuff, working it down into behavior-driven development methods, performs the actions and tells you, does it actually work? Not that it was configured to work, I hope it works, but it actually does it work and has proof and you could repeat it. So that's what this project is about. When you're trying to change the culture from a culture of no to a culture of yes, I guarantee you having proof and having it be repeatable will get you there a lot faster. What else we got here? What's the benefit? Um, a lot of times, I'm not gonna read these because you'll have this and you, know, you can read the bullet points. The benefit has been shown already by doing this. One, we're using cloud services. So that's the main benefit. That's where we wanna be and that's what we're getting. Ancillary benefits. We're getting there a lot quicker. We're getting there quicker and we actually have code, which I think a lot of you have experienced. Yep, I've done my research, I've made my argument, I've pitched to the architecture review committees and they said, sure, go ahead and try your idea in a sandbox. Did you know what you were doing when you turned it on? Nope, because you've never used it before. And that's why you've never been on, allowed to promote your ideas into higher level environments because there's no infrastructure, there's no security, there's no architecture built around it. This project is building those things so that you can go to your ARBs or cybers, whoever is approving this idea and saying, I can prove this works. I've used this. I know how this actually works and we're things that we didn't know about before, we need to pay attention to now. So that's the big difference of this project and that's really some of the major benefits you're gonna get from this. Participating in the project is going to apply another benefit. It's not just you saying, I believe this is something that's gonna be compliant. It's not going to be, my bank believes this is gonna be something compliant. It's going to be JP Morgan, it's gonna be Deutsche Bank, it's going to be Citi, it's gonna be Cap One, it's going to be whoever else is participating in the project already. And that's the value that this collaboration is going to bring because it's the weight of an industry that's ultimately going to say, we believe this, we've peer reviewed it, this works. And that's going to help you move a lot quicker. What I'm gonna get into here, uh, the process to solve the problem and things like that, I'm gonna pause here, ask a room, does everybody know what I'm talking about right now? Looks good? Don't be shy. I see you on your laptop back there. Okay, that's fine. Um, process and the problem. So I think the problem, everybody already knows what it was, what it is, what we were working on. How do we get this into be a process and a procedure rather than just an idea and a concept? After you go through and break down your control framework and say, these are all the controls that we've had in the past for our on-prem environments. This is what that looks like codified for cloud services or the cloud services that I'm talking about. I need to turn this into something I can churn out and repeat and have our process know what to expect, know how to interpret it, and then know how to approve it. So that's what Again, this project is starting to build towards. We have defined artifacts, a defined contribution model, the roles that you're gonna contribute in, and what those outputs are going to be. So as we can start to repeat that, we're gonna to start to churn out a lot more content. I can tell you at JP Morgan, once we started creating these, our internal compliance team and our architecture review boards, when they saw this content coming in, they knew they had less of a fight to put up because it was proven. They were happy to receive the actual data and facts rather than a uh, sales deck, which I think is a lot of what people get when they're in architectural review boards. It's only the best of what they have to offer. They kind of forget to mention all the warts. So when you have it code-driven and repeatable process, people have a higher level of assurance and trust, which is, again, change the culture, get things moving quicker. So that is some of the things there. So I've talked about it. Let's start looking at some of the 
stuff. So the major artifacts are going to be, the first one is, it's basically a, a big text document. It's going to say, for this cloud service, this and the major areas of security concerns that we have and compliance concerns, here's a highly opinionated uh, document that says, here's how you do this with reference material. Pretty simple stuff. It gets you to about from zero days of experience, about nine months of experience. That's the intent of the document. So if you've never used the service before and you read this document and you follow all the references, you're gonna gain the insight from about nine months of working with that service. The next artifact is going to be uh, something, something like this, where the major area, like security domain, encryption of data at rest. Everybody has that in some language in their control framework at their bank or institution. The control standard, again, high level, and then you're gonna break it down all the way to the uh, behavior-driven development. So that's like Gherkin. Who, who uses Gherkin process right now to, not very many. Okay, three, awesome. So generally, this is a game changer for your interactions with your compliance and security teams. You can have a conversation with them in plain language and say, I want data that comes from this data classification or this application or this environment to be encrypted so that nobody can look at it or so that something, whatever the scenario that they want to come up with in plain language again, which is why that interaction changes a lot between compliance and security and your AD teams, app dev teams, um, because this is a way to communicate more effectively. Then you generate the code that performs this action. So again, what's not shown in this slide right now is like the Terraform script, the implementation. So that is the, the straight up code that we're all used to seeing. And the, pro the process before was just to lint or filter that code and see if there's a one or a zero somewhere where you wanted it to be. That, that's great, but that says, I intend for this to work because that's the way the documentation told me it would work. But I have no assurance or guarantee without performing these BDD tests that it actually worked. So again, this project, that part right there is the main reason why this is more valuable than what other projects that you might, it's like, oh, this is kind of like that, or this is kind of like that. This is why this project is different. So now I can go through here and say, a user attempts to save data specifying this encryption method should be rejected. So what I'm saying there, I've translated from, I only want this encryption method allowed. That's to, uh, thou shalt statement is usually what you get from your security department. This is actually saying, okay, as an application developer, I have user functionality requirements and I'm actually building the action capabilities of what the application can do. This language helps you actually perform the test to know this works, this doesn't work. Any questions here? So with these, you, you put in the expected outcome, and then you, when you're writing out your control standard, you're actually gonna have more detail put in there to say, this should do this for this service. It, it's very much more specific. So the outcome is, I expect this to be uh, failed in the API call, and then you could automatically look that up. Or if you're going to interrogate a service configuration, um, you can perform these tests and see if it actually did it or not. Is that specific enough, or do you want? Okay, we have another question. So this can be implemented in your pipeline. So uh, as you're building it, that's more of the linting and things like that. Uh, we actually built out a virtualized environment initially to test this. And uh, that's not part of this project because that's more of the in-product solution. Uh, we're just building the content so we know how it's supposed to be configured. Um, it's also, we've implemented it runtime, real time. So continuous, all the time. Any more questions here? So, go ahead, the lady first, please. Uh, so, for the BDD, it's, it's vendor specific and then also service specific. Uh, and we just wanted to verify what things are you getting from the software vendors? Because in the case of Google Cloud, they say you encrypt your default all the time, but then you may have a requirement to say customer supplied encryption. 
right? And not something else. All right, so yes. Um, these things can be reworded. Remove SSE S3, put in language for Google or Azure. The assumption that it's encrypted all the time, it's a nice low, like slogan. Test, test, test. You'll find in some situations, no. Go ahead. All right, so you're jumping towards the end of why this project is going to be valuable. Um, I'll get to it. I'll answer that question later. I'm going to keep moving because I don't have a whole lot of time left. Uh, and I will take questions after this if anybody has questions. So a as we get into you know, filling this stuff out, the first artifact uh, is just kind of the highly opinionated with the references. We all get that. Uh, we can get into Terraform. We know what Terraform scripts, or this is a CloudFormation example, really. So whatever you're going to use to implement the service, there's going to be that. So basically, I've read the document. Great. I'm an AD, so I really don't care about that so much. I want to press go and try it out. That's what this does. Gets you using the service very rapidly with the pre-configured settings that you need to have there to be secure or compliant. BDD, we've already kind of talked about what BDD is, so I'm going to kind of move quickly through this. But essentially, everything can be tested like code because it is code. So that's the big game changer here is we stop talking just big words, fancy language, written documents. It's code. We no longer have time to sit and have these conversations and have one-off reviews for each architecture, for each application. There's requirements, and then there's the code to test it. And as long as we test and we trust the tests and the evaluations and the results, we can move more rapidly. And that's what, at the heart of this, is what we're trying to do. OK, examples. Very basic. But essentially, what we're saying here, again, plain language. I want to deploy an SQS stack correctly in the US and non-US region. So a lot of us are going to be regulated by um, data residency rules and regulations. So this is a very relevant thing for most of us. Scenario outline. I'm going to create the SQS CFN stack in US and non-US regions, given that I have validated OS credentials and with privileges to use CloudFormation. These are the types of things that kind of set up the scenario of how this action could occur. When I try to deploy the regional SQS stack in region, then the stack creation should result. You're setting this up. It should fail. It should pass. Something should happen. And then the example results, and this is, again, you're running this against architectures. You want to be able to see succeed, fail, whatever, depending on what you've approved or what you expect to happen. So as long as you can repeat that and see it every single time, it builds the confidence in the people who have said no. It changes the culture very rapidly. OK, I'm going to move. So we, we've built this. Um, this project is not about the tool we've built internally. This project is about how we build the configuration documents, the artifacts, the BDD scenarios, and things like that. We're partnering with other banks. As I mentioned, like there's several other banks and vendors already involved. Today, I'd like to take a quick pause here and ask a participant, um, Russell Green from uh, Deutsche Bank, to just say a few words about his participation. So did we have that mic? I got it. Oh, you got it? Does it work? Yep. No, thank you, Jason. Um, yeah, J Jason just wanted to um, bring someone else onto the stage to say um, a couple of words about the project. Um, one, just you know, for us to participate at Deutsche within a program like this is great because we're stealing a lot, I mean, uh, borrowing a lot of ideas from Jason's um, hard work over the last couple of years and how he's doing this. But in order to put the structure together, in order to, um, for us to start our cloud journey, or not start it, but continue it, is, is very exciting. Uh, so <clears throat> JP and Jason have been looking at this on one particular platform. It just happens that we are working towards looking at this on another platform. So as we 
you, you, you mentioned the services were all unique to the platform providers and stuff like that. What we'd like to do is contribute back, taking this IP to another platform, so allowing us to different banks to be able to move quickly between platforms and have those offerings rather than having the six, 12 months for every service. So for us, and then also that allows us potentially to move on to AWS a lot more quickly as part of ours. But you know, we have been through the journey of convincing the control functions, the security, and obviously going forward, the regulators. Um, and also we deal with different regulators all the time. So there is lots of different problems about which region you run in. So you may have different standards for different regulators as well. But um, <clears throat> I don't want to steal the thunder, but if we can do this successfully together and articulate what a good standard is for this type of environment, then we have a lot of voice in the industry to convince people to conform, to take this away from us so that we start to... Um, we start to see the benefits and we don't do ourselves all the time. And they understand what's important when they bring on new services because they are all the time, right? Hundreds of services. And we're never going to keep track of those if it takes us nine, 12 months to adopt each service. It just ain't going to happen. Absolutely. So very excited to be part of it. Thank you very much for st standing it up and looking forward to actually, um, you know, contributing something back, which we haven't done yet. So I have to be honest about that. They're being modest. Um, thank you, Russell. So... He led into a little bit of your question there. The long-term goals of this project, obviously the short-term is build these artifacts, get the configuration guides out there, peer review them, get more people contributing. Once we build a critical mass and we have enough contribution through the industry, we can push back on the cloud service providers and say, it should not take us as a customer nine months or longer just to begin to use your service you should be doing this for us. Also, the next phase of that, we're getting leverage on the cloud service providers and they're helping us out more. We're all using this and we've agreed that the configurations are more effective, meaning codified controls are helping us accelerate and get product out the door more quickly. And we feel that we have a better ability to know where we are compliant and non-compliant continuously rather than on whatever interval that we assess or review our applications. We bring that back to our regulators and say, we as an industry believe this is better and we would like you to adopt it. Can we help you? So that's where this is going. And it's going to be a little ways away until we're, <laughs> until we're there. But I think if we can start to build some steam, build some momentum, build content and show value, meaning Yes, we're rolling these things out. We're using it. People are starting to build tools. Vendors are starting to sell us products because they're consuming this. I think that's all going to help build the project and help us all out quite a bit. All right, so all these things are what JP was able to see as benefits at the end of the project. And I just don't say end as in it's over, we're done. We're still in need of all these hundreds of services across all the cloud service providers. We're still in need of improvements because the services are always improved and new features emerge. So this is a continuous cycle. And that's the other part of having this in GitHub is we can actually show commits, show changes when that triggers a peer review process or we start creating lists of, hey, there's a new feature in this service. Who wants to pick that up? That's where the project's all about. So this talk, if nothing else, is kind of a call to action, request for help, and just informing you of this is out there, this can be really helpful, and I'm looking for more participation, or at least just uh, if, if you have a better idea or a bunch of content, I'd love to see it. That's kind of the, where we are right now. Um, I kind of covered a little bit of that already. So right now, I have a minute or less. Any questions? Go ahead. We're delivering the stories, uh, the user stories and the BDD uh, scenarios. So the tooling is left out of this project specifically because I, I like the vendor participation and they want the ability to sell it. So there's that and as well as everybody's so unique. This was a conscious design choice, the project initiation, because everybody's on a different platform, different pipeline. So. As you can see, people are all upset, like, but I don't use AWS. Like, okay, so let's, let's do 
Google, Azure, whatever? Go ahead. Right. Right. So I'm running a little bit over time. Having it open source, having the code there, having it peer reviewed by multiple banks, we're hopefully can avoid situations like that. As far as when you consume it inside your own walls and people understand it or don't understand it, I can't solve everything with a project. <laughs> so uh, I can get us so far or help fix that problem so far just because. It, once it's in code and it's not someone's individual interpretation of some high-level language, code is pretty universal. It either does it or it doesn't. And that, that's, just, that's as far as I'm trying to take this right now. Um, I think I'm over time, but if there's any questions, I'll sit outside or something. So, thanks. All right.